Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining part three of our humanitarian applications using NASA Earth Observations uh, webinar series. Um, we uh, today are going to be talking about detecting agricultural and vegetation changes in and surrounding refugee settlements. As a reminder, this whole webinar series is scheduled around World Refugee Day on June 20th, 2022, and we've got four parts. Uh, the first part was on monitoring urban damage within SAR. Uh, we then shifted to mapping refugee settlement growth and population change. Here we are today um, on agriculture and vegetation. And uh, on Thursday of this week, we'll be talking about assessing climate hazards at refugee camps. Each of these uh, parts is two hours long, and we've got a question and answer session at the end of each. Um, all are going to be available online um, with the webinar recording as well as Q&A documents um, available into perpetuity. So thanks so much for joining. Um, the motivation for this part of the training really comes from uh, concerns around, well, interest and opportunities to see how we can use Earth observation data to uh, support refugee food security, protect land quality, which is to say avoid degradation. Um, these are really essential humanitarian goals that we see in site after site and certainly year after year. Um, these are both, uh, these aren't short-term challenges and they're really in some cases very difficult to address because many refugee settlements are inhabited for years and in some cases generations. So uh, that arrival, rapid arrival of population to an area that sort of increased population density can stress available resources and make um, some sort of existing pre-refugee arrival environmental conditions, uh, it can really cause a change in the ecosystem and um, put the uh, agriculture and vegetation condition into a new sort of phase of management or, or perhaps even stress. Of course, we know that satellite data are really useful for monitoring agriculture and vegetation of a whole different variety of types. Um, and this is especially, uh, they're especially helpful when we lack physical um, access to a certain site. And um, as we know from uh, the training part two, refugee settlements tend to be uh, located in um, border regions in uh, areas that are a little bit more difficult to access than, than a uh, traditional sort of or, or a large scale urban settlement, for example. So uh, today we're going to be uh, mapping vegetation dynamics within and surrounding refugee settlements. We'll be visualizing and measuring those changes in agricultural condition over time, and we'll be looking at like time uh, from a, a bunch of different perspectives. And we'll uh, be measuring changes in land degradation metrics, so estimates of land degradation before and following um, the settlement establishment. Um, we will have a homework assignment for this webinar series. Um, the answers will be uh, are expected to be submitted via the Google form that will be found on the training page. We have a link there. Um, that'll be due July 7th. Um, completion of that homework alongside the attendance of all the webinars um, will earn you a certificate of completion, uh, which will be sent about two months after the completion of the course. So check out um, the training page for more information on the homework assignment as well as the um, uh, completion certificate of completion. Uh, we have the same presenters today as we did in part two last week. My name is Jamin Vanderhoek. I'm an associate professor of geography at Oregon State University. And uh, Hannah Friedrich is our other co-presenter today. She is a PhD student at the University of Arizona. And thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, just like last time, we'll be using Google Earth Engine for our analyses. Uh, if you haven't already, check out the Earth Engine site, click sign up, and then follow along with our uh, demonstrations today. There are um, at least five uh, previous RSET trainings that we think will be useful leading into this training. Um, we cover, uh, this is fairly broad in terms of the, the scope, so uh, certainly the fundamentals of remote sensing, but then land monitoring, um, agricultural applications, uh, land degradation, and then time series uh, would all be really helpful, and those are all excellent trainings in their own right. So check those out. Um, not critical to go through those, but I think uh, they'll be really helpful to get you a leg up. So some of the things that we're sort of taking for granted when we introduce uh, the coding aspect or some of the co concepts as well, uh, those should be covered uh, in much more detail in those other trainings. So shifting into some of the 
kind of context and background for this uh, part of the training. Why is it important to monitor vegetation change in and surrounding refugee settlements? Um, this section of the presentation is broadly the same as the as the background from uh, part two. So if you attended part two, this will more or less be the same. But um, the the main answer there is that around why this is important as well. This is a big problem supporting refugees around the world. Um, we had uh, 26 million refugees across 170 countries at the end of last year. It's a global scale phenomenon. Um, just to, to make sure we're all on the same page about what is and is not, or who is and who is not a refugee, this is a legal term. So refugees are international migrants who have been forcibly displaced from their home countries due to violence or persecution. And they have to cross an international border and seek asylum where they will receive protection under international law. So um, terms like, uh, which you may have heard, climate refugees or um, internally displaced person or people, IDPs, those are different categories of what we would call population of concern or people of concern. Uh, refugees are, are a special category in that, and there's a whole diversity of, of uh, refugee communities around the world. Um, this is just one example showing um, a snapshot of uh, lots of people um, on the move, um, Syrians leaving, um, on their way to leaving at least, uh, the country in total, we have about 6.7 million refu Syrian refugees uh, across uh, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. Um, that border crossing of Syrians into uh, neighboring countries and seeking asylum, that is the mode. That's the most common practice. 73% of refugees seek asylum in their directly neighboring, which is to say border countries. Um, similarly, with South Sudanese refugees, 2.2 million refugees are in Kenya and Uganda, which which border um, South Sudan. So we have um, a, a, a disproportionate burden, really, um, expectation of these border countries to support um, refugee needs. And uh, in actuality, that means that most of the world's refugee needs are being addressed by developing countries. It's their neighboring countries. Um, and so this is a this is a challenge where we have large population arrivals um, in areas of some countries that are already strapped in for uh, providing uh, resources to citizens of the country, much less say 600,000 refugees um, that have arrived over you know a three month period, which is not necessarily an atypical uh, arrival uh, sort of trend. Um, so it's very difficult to support um, this global population uh, at large, but also in these specific contexts. And um, most of the support for this comes from international donors. But year after year, the, um, the needs are the financial requests, the financial needs go unfulfilled, usually by quite a wide margin. Um, making all this more difficult, well, over the last decade or so, the global uh, forcibly displaced population has doubled the estimates um, from just um, the halfway point through 2022 show that we're still on this track for increasing um, global uh, forcibly displaced population amongst, uh, within that broader population are refugees. Um, and so we have this every year uh, for the last um, 10, 12 years, we have the population increasing. Um, we also are not necessarily seeing an increased uh, rate of returnees where uh, people who are given asylum and declared refugees are returning home to their home country. So this is the rate of, of new refugees is, is still outpacing the rate of refugees. I'm sorry, of returnees. Um, and it's not just the new refugees. It's not just um, the, the new refugees that are contributing to this global population. There's a broad population that um, is living in what we call a protracted refugee situation. Two out of three refugees live in the circumstance um, where they're in exile for five consecutive years or more. And on average, it's more. On average, uh, it varies every year, but usually it hovers around a decade um, is the typical uh, duration of, of being uh, in asylum, being a refugee abroad. Um, so this is not only a long-term problem in that we have um, the global forcibly displaced population increases every year. Um, it also just at an individual or a 
a household or a family level, um, this is this is the norm where we have a long-standing displacement. Um, and with families, with refugee families that have been displaced, we have lots of uh, refugee children being born. We have um, a million refugee um, children born last year. So it's it's a serious challenge to try to uh, support the needs of such a large, diffuse, and varied population. The uh, UN Refugee Agency is uh, called the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. They shelter nearly a third of the global refugee population within settlements, which is to say in, um, in settlements outside of existing urban areas. So these are not cases where we're integrating refugees into existing um, cities or villages. These are new settlements um, that are being established and planned by the UNHCR. Um, these are really the loci for uh, distribution of aid and provision of uh, different services and resources, uh, education, um, medical attention, um, farming. This happens um, broadly in these sort of base uh, settlement, refugee settlement locations. Um, because of these large scale refugee arrivals um, that often happen very, very quickly, there's a um, great need to establish and plan and allocate land for refugee settlements quite quickly. You can see this graphic of a Sentinel-2 uh, time series animation here where in the middle of 2016, as we're coming up here in a few frames, we start seeing the first indication of the infrastructure of, of a settlement in uh, Uganda called Pajarina, which we'll be talking about later in this training. Um, that gets laid out. Uh, you can see right there um, in uh, June, July, it really uh, grows to its full extent within a few months. So this rapid period of refugee arrival is also when um, we have terrific need for um, geospatial data, remote sensing data that help us monitor uh, the establishment and growth and, of course, the needs of refugees uh, who, as best we can tell, as best we can develop an estimate or proxy of that through satellite data analysis. Quite a variety um, in what a camp could look like. We have a um, unplanned, so-called unplanned or self-organized self-settled rather, a camp on the left. We have a planned camp on the right. This distinction between these two camps is most clearly seen in the, um, the grid pattern between uh, the two settlements where we have the roadway uh, grid laid out on the right and we don't have the grid present on the left. The difference between these two is just because the, uh, there's basically more time and perhaps more resources for the settlement on the right compared to the one on the left in terms of the early establishment and planning stage. Um, in a sense, the, the unplanned settlement on the left may have just been a much more acute need to be established rapidly um, and, and there's just not as much time or resources to lay out the grid like we see on the right. Um, there's a, a broad variety of conditions across different refugee settlements. Um, we have a kind of an urban built up uh, camp on the left in Zatri, Jordan, and then we have Kutuklong on the right in Bangladesh, where uh, Rohingya refugees are. Um, the different setup that we see of different refugee settlements really conforms to these local contexts. So the refugee camp, the Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh, you can see is uh, many dwellings are built into, uh, well, the landscape is terraced, okay. and then the dwellings are established on top of these terraced uh, lands, very, very different from uh, this semi-arid, uh, fairly flat landscape um, in, in Jordan that hosts the Syrian refugee camp. So lots of diversity. Um, and despite all this uh, variability in terms of environmental conditions, the rate of refugee arrivals, the duration, satellite remote sensing data offer a sort of persistent gaze um, that, uh, that uh, go that is present throughout um, this period from the establishment to the uh, to the expansion of the settlement and then into into you know the, the subsequent long-term habitation in some cases so um, it's a terrific asset satellite remote sensing for monitoring um, humanitarian conditions at refugee settlements big one of course is that we do this remotely where we don't need physical access uh, to these locations um, we mentioned that one earlier um, but we also have broad scale coverage. So across many, many refugee settlements, we can get the same kind of data. So there's a consistency and a, and a comparison that uh, satellite data offer that we um, don't necessarily have with other kinds of um, even aerial uh, instruments where we have different kinds of acquisition conditions perhaps, or on the ground where we may uh, have 
different kinds of sampling regimes, uh, interview data collection uh, approaches in different settlements. Uh, we also have, uh, it's not just long term, but we have near real time uh, data collection um, that that uh, allows us to monitor changes in some cases really close to, to the rate at which they're happening. Um, as we all know, satellite data are very flexible. They can be adapted to support really a uh, wide range of different lines of inquiry um, related to um, atmospheric, related to terrestrial, hydrological, um, all of these different sort of facets um, of the uh, land cover land use domain are also well, can be well captured um, with uh, satellite data. Um, and while the data may be broad in scale and long term, they also offer some really helpful uh, information on localized insights. So we can tailor our analysis, tailor our, our inspection um, to the specifics of a specific community or population or settlements, livelihoods or land use or sustainable development concerns. Um, and so this gets back to some of the flexibility, but it, it can be really customized to give us uh, very local information. And we'll see some examples of that in today's presentation, as we saw um, in part two as well. Um, what about the refugee settlement dynamics? Well, um, we have uh, we know that refugee settlements are very dynamic, so time series and different kind of visualizations can help a lot. Um, these settlements grow very quickly, so we want to uh, monitor these trends as they as they uh, happen. Um, and there's a whole variety of changes that happen all sometimes at the same time within the same um, span between two different images. So we want to um, have some sensitivity to understand the complexity and the variability of all of these different changes. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Hannah Friedrich, who will introduce our case study on refugee settlements in Uganda and Jordan. Thanks, Jamin. Okay, so now we're going to shift to some of the training or different tasks um, portion of this training. Um, and first, we're going to um, start with a background of kind of more context on what refugee settlements are like in Uganda um, and why they exist there. So the total refugee population in Uganda currently is about 1.4 million people, um, which is comprised uh, primarily of refugees from South Sudan, with about 950,000 people from South Sudan. And about 444,000 from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and this total population of 1.4 million makes Uganda the third largest refugee hosting country in the world. Um, so it, it has received a lot of kind of um, attention to, to the refugee settlements in Uganda. Um, and most of these refugees coming from South Sudan and DRC um, are being displaced from their home countries due to violence and armed conflict and, and persecution. Um, but refugee settlements in Uganda are really unique in the sense that Uganda's refugee response policy um, really uplifts this notion of self-reliance. Um, and one of the ways that they kind of roll out this policy is by providing all refugee family units with a plot of uh, land that they use for constructing a house or a dwelling, um, as well as providing within that plot of land um, area for cultivating agriculture, um, which is not the norm in, in other refugee hosting countries. Um, and so that model of having access to, to agriculture within kind of like your own home area within a settlement is, is really unique. Um, and in addition to that kind of um, the setup of, of the settlement itself at the family level, refugees also are granted access to services such as healthcare and education. Um, so refugees use the same healthcare um, or access the same clinics and go to the same schools as that of Ugandan nationals, um, which is also really um, kind of sets Uganda aside in terms of what, um, how, how they treat refugees um, and welcome them to their country. Um, in addition to that, they have this policy on freedom of movement. So refugees are able to come and go 
from the settlement as they please, which opens up a lot of opportunities for gaining education or employment um, and accessing services outside of the, the settlement itself. Um, so it, it's a really interesting case study to kind of look at some of these dynamics that we'll be going into in this training. So in total, there are 32 UHCR managed refugee settlements across Uganda. Um, they're scattered in the northern and western regions of the country. The majority of the settlements are located in the northern portion, um, where some of them are really closely clustered, as is the case with these settlements located here in the middle uh, in set A. Um, and some of them are scattered or dispersed quite far apart from one another, as we see here in, in the Western region. Uh, but the kind of interesting take or takeaways with uh, the geography of refugee settlements in Uganda is the distribution in the total size of these settlements. So some of them can be really small, as we see here with these settlements in the middle, and others like Bidi Bidi or Rhino Camp or Naka Valley in the Western region are really large. Uh, and so they can comprise multiple uh, settlements within these larger settlement boundaries, um, which I won't go into too much detail about here, but there's really a, a quite a large variability in the size and extent of the settlements um, and when they were established as well. So looking at the timeline of refugee, the total Uganda refugee population, we see this really massive spike in the total population starting around 2014, and that aligns with when uh, the civil war was happening in South Sudan and brought um, close to approximately a million people across the border from South Sudan into Uganda. So um, yeah, the the settlements themselves, um, some of them date back to the 1960s um, and have remained open since then, but majority of the settlements, of these 32 settlements, were established in response to this uh, large influx of refugees uh, in the mid-2010s. So these maps show uh, some of the, the kind of there's a base map, a uh, satellite base map here, um, but demonstrates the variability in, in settlement layout that Jamin was discussing earlier, where we have Aila 1, which has this grid-like structure of streets that are visible in the base map. Um, and then in, in Miri, for example, we see a much more organic kind of layout of dwellings and footpaths between structures. And so, these different maps kind of demonstrate that, that variability that we saw or discussed earlier. Uh, for, the, for this training, we'll be focusing on Pajarina Refugee Settlement, which uh, was established in mid-2016. It's located within that northern cluster of settlements in Uganda. Um, and here we see, just looking at the, in this middle map, the UNHCR settlement planned boundary outlined here in blue, which will be important for um, one of the, the tasks that we'll be diving into momentarily, um, as well as some, I've included uh, the OSM road network here, as well as some landscape features as the refugee response offices and market center. And so the this OSM data, um, as well as the UNHCR settlement boundary data uh, is collected uh, and hosted on OSM, um, and yeah, um, is is available also through the humanitarian data exchange uh, site. So the settlement boundaries uh, are all publicly available, and you can access them there. Uh, lastly, in this map on the right hand side, we have a map of the ESA 2020 World Cover data set, which will be um, diving into with our next task. So we can see here that um, even within this one settlement, uh, we, there's a really large diversity in types of land covers that are present both within the settlement boundary and outside of um, and peripheral to the, 
the boundary itself. Yes, yeah, so we will be focusing on Pajarino, which again was opened in 2016 um, and is located in northern Uganda. It hosts about 36,000 refugees um, exclusively from, from South Sudan. And we'll also be looking at a settlement that looks very differently from, from what Pajarino looks like, at least in satellite imagery, which is Sauteri Refugee Settlement. Uh, that was opened in 2012 and is located in northern Jordan and hosts about 80,000 refugees from Syria. So these are images taken at different scales, but side by side we can see quite a few differences in, in the settlement layout. Um, even though there is you know, some grid-like structure visible at Pajarina, we see a much more kind of organized um, layout here in at Zotary. Um, another kind of important distinction between these two settlements is the, the settlement boundary itself. So with Pajarina, the settlement boundary kind of conforms um, in some areas tightly against where we see some built up areas, but also includes areas that are not built up. Um, in, in contrast, the Zatari refugee settlement boundary is really tightly um, kind of snug around where we see built up area at the settlement itself. Um, and so those two different types of, of um, conditions of the, these two settlement boundaries um, presents unique challenges for, for understanding land cover dynamics within a settlement boundary. Um, so these are the two settlements that we will be returning to and comparing uh, throughout the remainder of the training. So our first task um, is to visualize and compare different line cover products. So before we can even start to look at different dynamics at refugee settlements, it's really useful to have a sense of, um, well, just to situate ourselves with what's happening at uh, at a settlement in terms of the land cover present, um, and then thinking about how those land covers change over time and um, different transitions that may happen and at what rates and when. Um, so just having these snapshots of, of land cover for a given time is a really useful starting place. Um, so to begin, we'll be looking at two different land cover products, both representing uh, land cover nominally from 2020. The first is the Esri land cover product, um, which is constructed using Sentinel-2 imagery, um, which is a 10 meter optical image product. Um, and the Esri land cover product has 10 different classes um, listed here on the left. Um, and the second product we'll be looking at is the ESA World Cover 2020 product, um, which is built or constructed using both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. So um, unlike Esri, which is just using Sentinel-2, ESA is using both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Um, it's also a 10 meter product and has 11 uh, different classes that it uses. And so um, there are um, pretty, there some similar classes between the two products in terms of water and trees, um, built area, bare ground, but there's other kind of unique differences between Esri and Isa and that Esri has this class called flooded vegetation and grass. Um, and Isa has a bit more distinction between the, the vegetation classes in that it has shrubland, grassland, herbaceous wetland and mangrove. So as well as moss and lichen. Um, so there are these kind of unique uh, distinctions between the two class schemes of these two products. Um, and you can also click on these two links and pop out to learn more about each of the respective products. So I'll just show for Esri. Um, this is hosted as a publicly available asset on Earth Engine, which you can read more about here, as well as the ESA product, which is hosted directly on the um, Earth Engine data catalog. So if we go back and click on this Earth Engine code link, we are brought to this page here. And so 
um, yeah, we'll be launching into to the walking through the script here itself. So we first bring in both the Pajarina and Zatri uh, two different features, um, and then there's a variable called AOI, which allows us to quickly toggle between either Pajarina or Zatri. Um, so right now we're looking at Pajarina, but I'll show Zatri in just a second. Um, and I'm not going to go into line by line what's going on with the, the code here itself, but we have essentially are adding both of the land cover products, the Azure and ESA, to the map and adding legends for both of those and then creating this split panel map, um, which allows us to go back and forth between um, visualizing the two, the two layers on the map um, at the same time. Um, so this is a really kind of useful application of having using the the split uh, panel function in in Google Earth Engine. Um, so yeah, the and if we look at what's going on in the maps themselves and compare compare the two products, we see um, starting out here with just the, the base map itself. Um, for those who attended the previous training, you learned about the evolution of built up area at Pajarina over time. So just to situate ourselves, um, this blue outline is the settlement boundary. And then just looking at the base map, we can see that there's um, some roads, different dwellings, um, some larger than others, as is the case with these buildings, but um, there's also vegetation within the settlement. Um, and as we know from the refugee policy, there's also agriculture happening uh, in and around these, these unique individual dwellings. So there's a mix of land cover happening within this entire blue outline itself. Um, and then if we bring this over to look at Esri, we can see that most of it um, is being classified as built up, which is, which is good. That kind of conforms with what we see in the base map. Um, and then there's classifications of scrub or shrub in this kind of beige color around, as well as trees in the very northern portion um, and crops just right here on the southern edge. And then to the right or east of Pajarina, we see a bit of grass being detected. So um, overall, Esri is doing well at picking up built up area, um, but is kind of aggregating the classifications into this giant blob like um, polygon, which we know that there's a lot more complicated land cover uh, happening within the settlement itself. So some of that is being masked um, and kind of, yeah, not really the details of these different land covers that we can see isn't being captured with the Esri land cover product. So comparing that with the ESA product, which we can turn on and drag the slider over to view. Um, we can see that there's a lot more um, complexity in the spatial frequency of land covers being represented um, and just the, the variety um, present. So we see that the yellow, there's a lot of grassland being, being classified. The pink is cropland, the red is built up. So interestingly, the ESA product is still capturing some built up, but what it is capturing looks to be mostly that road network. Um, and then a little bit of the larger building uh, structures that we saw um, on just on the corner of the settlement and in, within it. So um, it's not doing a great job at picking up built up area. Um, it's also designating some area as shrubland. And unlike the Esri product, which is designating this northern kind of pocket as trees, which 
seems about right compared to what we see in the base map, uh, the ESA product isn't picking up on that um, those that forested or tree area up here. So um, definitely a lot of differences that we see between between the two here. Um, let's toggle this to take a look at what's going on with the two products at Zotri. So I can just copy this, change the AOI to Zotri, rerun it. Okay, so again, just to situate ourselves, um, this is the base map. We see a lot of built up area and given just the background vegetation or lack of vegetation, a lot of bare ground um, at, at Zotri. Um, so zooming out a little bit. For the Esri product, we see a lot of built up area being detected in this red blob, um, some of which is extending beyond the settlement boundary. Um, and then this kind of western corner is being designated as a mix of either scrub or shrub um, and bare ground. So pretty kind of similar to what we saw with the types of land covers being captured at Pajarina with the Esri product in that there's a large built up area uh, blob um, and then some, some complementary classes being included. Um, there's interesting that we see that there's some cropland being detected or classified um, both to the east and west of Zotri. Um, and if we turn this off and look at the base map, we do see some, some cropland um, at that area here, but um, you know, there's these fields which um, are to the south, which are being designated as bare ground in that case. So um, definitely some kind of disparities in what's being considered cropland. Uh, with Esri compared to what we see in the base map. And if we switch to the ESA product, um, we see a really different picture as well. So um, we also see that it's picking up built up in a lot of the street like, or, or where there's their streets. So another kind of similarity between Pajarina and Zotri and that ESA is picking up in this the built up areas, the street network, um, but most of it is being classified as barren or sparse vegetation. And so, um, yeah, that, that's an interesting kind of effect happening here with, with the ESA product. Um, it is picking up on some of that cropland that we were just looking at um, and yeah, so overall it's, you know, detecting some built up area, but is designating most of the settlement as this barren or sparse vegetation class, um, which there are areas within the settlement that do have bare ground um, and maybe some sparse vegetation happening, but overall individual dwellings or areas where there's these really tightly clustered buildings together. Um, those are not being captured as built up and being classified as, as barren or sparse vegetation. So just walking through what we just looked at in the code editor. Um, so we see quite a bit of distinctions between both similarities and differences between the products at both sites. Um, to summarize, the ESA World Product World Cover Product appears to overlook built up at both settlements, um, but especially at Pajarina, there was hardly any built up area detected there. Um, and the Esri Land Cover Product, um, on the other hand, seems to do pretty well at detecting built up area. Um, 
at both sites, but fails to overlook um, important land cover classes like agriculture, um, as we saw in the case as at Pajarina. Um, so this kind of really underscores this takeaway message that each product offers unique insights on land cover, but both of them each have their unique flaws and blind spots. So there really is no such thing as an error-free data set, and that also extends to land cover products. Um, and so these disparities between the two data sets, as well as um, you know, just inaccuracies in the line cover that's classified within each of them um, has the potential to have these cascading consequences of over underrepresented classes. Um, and this is, has implications for uh, a, a bunch of different kind of follow on data products that are constructed using land cover products. So things like satellite informed estimates of the population, uh, which we talked about in the training too. Um, so some of these satellite informed products use uh, input data sets that rely on land cover classifications to allocate population totals to built up areas. And so if there's underestimation or lack of built up area being detected, and that is being used to allocate population totals, those population totals will be misrepresented or misallocated spatially. So um, that's one instance of, of kind of a, a cascading consequence of these underrepresented classes. Uh, but it also is important for um, understanding, you know, limitations with assessing sustainable development goals. Um, which we'll get into in one of the future tasks for this training, as well as analysis of climate hazards or future uh, climate projections, understanding you know, what land covers may be impacted by certain types of extreme events, um, uh, which is important yeah, for understanding uh, future risk. So that will be covered in, in the fourth training of this training series. And so knowing that we, we have these land cover products that we can rely on to get a sense of kind of the context of what's happening at refugee settlements, but that may not always be enough to understand, as we saw, um, built up areas or agriculture, or these different um, kind of different dynamics that, that could be present within a settlement. Um, and so kind of going into this, this next portion of the training, we'll be talking about um, how you can, you know, given this limitation in, in land cover products not accurately showing where built up area is, we can use satellite imagery um, to, to better understand where there's built up area um, within the settlement itself. So, um, as we uh, saw earlier, this blue outline is the planned or official UNHCR settlement boundary for Pajarina. Um, and this is the land that, quote unquote, officially delineates the refugee settlement. So um, this boundary is, for all intents and purposes, meant to distinguish land that can be directly accessed and used by refugees. And so even though there is that pretty open doors policy in terms of um, refugee mobility within um, and outside of the settlement boundary. Um, the, the formal boundary does have some weight to it and what it means for um, where um, refugees um, can access land. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's some portions of, of Pajarina that aren't you know, built up. We have this forested area and some you know, like open areas here on the edges. And so um, the, the planning boundary may include this land that isn't yet used by refugees for dwellings or agriculture. Um, and given that, we may want to instead create or have a functional settlement boundary that better reflects the extent of refugee land use. So um, even though refugees may be able to 
go into this area of the of the settlement itself, they may not be making any, you know, land cover changes within those areas or doing any actions that lead to changes there. And so having a functional settlement boundary allows us to see where there are actually changes happening um, with with refugee refugees being present. And so there are numerous kind of different satellite derived settlement data sets that can be used um, to help us delineate this quote unquote functional refugee settlement boundary as opposed to the planning boundary. Uh, and those include the global human settlement layer, uh, the high resolution settlement layer, the world settlement footprint, uh, as well as the georeferenced infrastructure and demographic data for development data set or otherwise called grid three. Um, and so while these are all meant to represent settlement or built up area, we can see here looking at a kind of side by side of what each of these products look like at Pajarina itself that most of them do a really poor job at actually classifying or estimating settlement. So um, just looking at the Sentinel-2, a true color uh, visualization of Sentinel-2, you know, we see this built up area, but with both GHSL, HRSL, as well as the World Settlement Footprint, WSF, there's very few <laughs> area within the settlement that's captured as a settlement or built up area. In contrast, uh, Grid 3 um, does a really good job at, at estimating settlement, um, but um, you know, comes with its own limitations in that it's only available for certain certain areas. Um, and you know, taking all of these with a grain of salt, they they are all kind of delineated using very different methods, but all rely on on satellite imagery to um, be developed. Um, so we see that even just overlaying where we have coverage amongst these four products, that HRSL is picking up some some pixels, but overall um, we can't rely on um, HSL, HRSL, or WSF to really give us a good idea of where this built-up area is located. So our next task is to actually estimate a functional settlement boundary using k-means clustering. So k-means is a unsupervised classifier, um, which means that it doesn't require uh, user-provided um, input training data. Um, and so it randomly um, partition spectral space, so the, the data that we have through, through satellite imagery into different classes. And then the clustering will then iteratively go through and cluster each image pixel into however many classes the user designates that they want um, based on a minimum distance to the class centroid. So there's what's called a, a feature spectral space that all the pixel values um, for the given image is um, kind of distributed within. And then depending on how many classes the user says that it wants those pixels to be classified within, um, it will look at how far each spectral value is to these two or however many centroids the user designates as in the number of classes and then we'll distribute or partition each of those features to whatever class it is closest towards. Um, and so k-means clustering is, um, can be used in Earth Engine. And so within this, this code link that we'll get into, um, it'll allow you to distinguish between either running the k-means at Pajarina or Zotri using either Landsat 8 or Sentinel-2. Um, and will allow you to cluster based on three different spectral indices, uh, NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, NDVI, which is the Normalized Difference Built Up Index, or the Normalized Burn Ratio, um, NVR. Um, and it will allow you to do this clustering for an image composite, um, which you can choose the start and end dates for. And with that, um, 
we'll be able to compare the resulting functional boundary that results from the k-means clustering to the official unit hcr planning boundary um, as well as bring in the google open buildings footprints um, and the microsoft building footprints which are two different uh, publicly available data sets representing building footprints uh, and see how they compare to our functional settlement boundary that we create using the k-means um, and then we can also kind of compare those to um, how well the k-means is doing between uh, both Pajarina and Zotri. So I'm going to kick in here to the code link for this task. So again, we're bringing in Pajarina and Zotri. Um, here are the user inputs that I mentioned that you'll able, be able to toggle between. So you can run it between Pajarina or Zotri. You can choose the sensor um, being Landsat 8 or S2, um, Sentinel 2. You can choose the index as well as the start and end date. And so um, I'll just kind of quickly walk through here how we're making the composite, which is important for why we're choosing when we're choosing the start and end date. So um, whatever AOI we have, whether it's Pajarina or Zotri, we're gonna create a buffered bounding box around that settlement boundary. We have a function called add indices, which will allow us to um, calculate the indices for whatever image collection that we'll be using, whether it's Landsat 8 or Sentinel-2. Um, some primer variables to allow us to rename our bands so they are a bit more interpretable um, from either, um, yeah, essentially translating the bands for both Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 into band names like blue, green, red, infrared, et cetera. Um, and then we have queuing up our, our image composites itself. We'll bring in uh, the image collections for Landsat 8 in Sentinel-2, and for each of those, we'll do kind of a series of filtering. Um, so first, we'll filter by date. So this is where our start date and end date comes in. And so choosing this date, you'll want to find a date that is that you know is essentially, well, you can choose whatever date you'd like, but um, after when we know the settlement was established. Um, so if we want to get at a sense of a functional boundary, um, for Pajarina, which we know was established in mid-2016, we could choose any date range kind of after mid-2016 if we want to identify this kind of built-up related functional settlement boundary that we'll be delineating. Um, but as we'll explore, you can use different date ranges to kind of compare when that functional boundary, um, how it changes through time. So if we were to change this to 2016, middle 2016 through the end of 2016, that functional boundary will represent a very different um, functional boundary than when we have 2019 through 20, sorry, mid 2019 through into 2019. So um, it kind of depends on the question and context that you're after for designating the start and end dates. Um, so then we'll also filter by the bound. So we're just gonna filter for our, our bounding boxes, filtering to images of less than 40% cloud cover, changing our band names and adding those indices. Um, and then we will create a, a post median, this variable called post median, which is essentially a median composite. So collapsing all of our pixel values across our start and end date image collection into the median. Um, so this will give us the, the median composite for whatever our date range is. And then clipping that to our buffer bounds. And then this code chunk here will then set up the k-means classifier. So to do that, we because it's unsupervised, we're not inputting any training data. So we're sampling training data from our, our median composite, which we can do using this sample method. Um, and then we define uh, certain parameters for k-means. So importantly here, we're defining two as our number of clusters or classes that we want k-means to classify based on. Um, so the kind of logic behind that is that we want to identify settlement and non-settlement. So we have two classes. 
and then we're going to tell it to iterate um, five times and the seed value is just so we can replicate our results in the future if we want to rerun this. Um, here this sets up the actual cluster using the parameters that we designated and then we've applied the k-means class sorry k-means cluster classification uh, model to the that median composite that we created. Um, and then we do a little bit of post-processing with the output um, to apply a morphological filter, which is essentially cleaning up the output that we get from k-means. So it's a little bit more the pixels that are on their own are next to pixels that are not of the same class get filtered out and pixels that are of the same class get essentially aggregated together. So it kind of cleans the output, which we'll see here what that looks like in just a second. Um, and then we do a, a, a step here where we apply the filter um, and that essentially gives us our, our cleaned k-means output and then we'll reduce that raster to a vector so we can have a, a settlement functional boundary which is a vector we can compare with our our official settlement boundary um, and then we will add those two to the map um, as well as bringing in the Google and Microsoft buildings data sets um, so I know that's a lot of, of code to walk through in a short amount of time but hopefully the um, this will be a little bit more illustrative what we're getting at so here um, we have our post median with the NDVI visualized. So that was the parameter that I chose here. We're using Pajarina, using Sentinel-2 NDVI for this given time period. Um, and then um, our samples. So these are our sample points where we're gathering those NDVI values. Our immediate or preliminary kind of k-means output. So this is the designation between um, settlement and no settlement, as kind of deemed by our two-class k-means uh, clustering model. This is the cleaned k-means. So after applying that kernel uh, morphological operation, um, this is. We have our cleaned polygon, but what's really important is just grabbing the settlement um, boundary from this cleaned polygon, which is our, our k-means kind of, this is our functional, our derived functional k-means settlement boundary. And so if we compare that with the formal UNHCR settlement boundary, we do see that this functional boundary is capturing a bit more of the kind of constraint to the, the built up area itself, as well as this area outside of the boundary, which based off of our NDBI composite that we're using to delineate the functional boundary is including some agricultural area, um, you know, different um, areas of land that were kind of undergone some sort of transition um, right next to the settlement itself. So this functional boundary allows us to get a better, you know, understand where there's some sort of um, changes happening um, next to the settlement. And yeah, if we bring in the Google footprints here, um, so there's both a designated high and low confidence, which don't really um, just means that the high confidence ones are have a higher confidence of being classified as building footprints. And so if we zoom in, um, we see that the the building footprints for the Google building footprints align pretty well with where we see um, the location for the, the functional settlement boundary. Um, this is all reloading, but um, if it, once it eventually does finish reloading, um, 
we'll see that there's actually no Microsoft building footprints detected here um, at Pajarina. Um, but yeah, just kind of a, a supplementary data layer to bring in and, and see how it compares with our, our functional settlement boundary. Um, I'm going to switch back here to our slideshow. So another kind of parameter set that you can apply is using Landsat A at Pajarina, um, using NDVI um, with a pretty different start end date of 2017. Um, just the entire year. And so we saw um, compared to the one that we just actually walked through in, in the code that this settlement functional boundary is quite similar, some quite different from uh, this, this functional settlement boundary using Landsat A and DBI from, from 2017. So um, you can kind of customize in this sense what you know not only the dates of interest for the the composite that you'll be using to delineate the boundary but based off of ndvi which is looking at essentially greenness or vegetation um, compared to ndvi which is built up area um, as well as the input sensor that you're using landsat 8 which is a 30 meter versus sentinel 2 which is a 10 meter um, you can have quite different functional boundaries that result, um, but each kind of provide their own unique insights into um, this distinction between these classes, um, you know, between a sensibly settlement and no settlement um, in this case. So um, our estimation of the refugee settlement functional boundary again, depends on the sensor, the spectral metric, and the image date. And so this is just kind of another example of how if we look at um, kind of the true color imagery back in time from when the functional boundary was developed. So in this case, this one was developed from July 2018. And we see here that based off of this date in time, the functional boundary performs really well in terms of constraining or identifying this kind of settlement functional area. And if we look in hindsight back through time, that this boundary, you know, isn't a, is um, including areas that haven't yet changed um, or haven't under yet undergone some sort of transition. So sometime between, um, in these two cases, August um, 2016 and July, 2018, that there's some transitions of, you know, agricultural cultivation and additional built-up area being constructed in this area where we see just vegetated area. And so over time, we can see that these land cover change dynamics are um, continuing to happen after the settlement is established. And we can use these functional boundaries in at different time periods to understand and help elucidate some of these land cover dynamics. All right, I'm going to stop there and pass it back to, to Jamin. Thanks, Hannah. Um, we're gonna turn now to looking at visualizing differences in vegetation condition between years, again, at Pajarina Refugee Settlement. The approach we're using is generally called uh, a false color compositing approach. Compositing approach. That's commonly used for visualizing uh, near infrared, red and green bands, rather than red, green, blue. We're using near infrared, um, uh, red and green to highlight vegetative conditions. So that's typically how we'd use a false color composite or at least atypical false color composite. In this case, we're going to switch that around and instead of using um, a spectral band, uh, spectral data for a given band, we're gonna use NDVI from a certain period. And in this case, we're gonna be looking at uh, three seasons throughout uh, a given year, sort of an agricultural calendar and putting NDVI from those three seasons together into a single composite and then visualizing that. So that means that if we have high NDVI across all three seasons, it should appear as a very bright, uh, close to white perhaps, color pixel. If NDVI is very low across all three seasons, uh, we see a very dark, potentially black pixel. Usually we end up seeing some, um, if there's change between those seasons, uh, we see different 
kinds of coloration and different combinations as well um, between the red, the green, and the blue. So in this case, uh, on the left-hand side, we see a false color composite of 2016 NDVI image at Pajrina. Um, this, uh, we see quite clearly this bright red grid coming through this infrastructure, uh, looks like infrastructure at least, uh, roadways and some uh, dwellings uh, within the, the, the uh, gridded uh, street layout. What we're, why we're seeing this as red is, is because, as we know, Pajrina was settled um, in the middle of 2016. And in this example, we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail, but in this example, season one, NDVI was captured before the refugee settlement was established. So we had a higher NDVI at Pajarina before it was settled. And then later in the year, we see lower NDVI. Again, we're talking about this left-hand side, 2016 red colored image. That means that that high NDVI, uh, the high NDVI from season one is colored as red. We have low NDVI from season two and three. So we see this red really coming through uh, prominently at the locations of what ended up being vegetative loss, right? So in a sense, this is a way of us um, capturing um, some of the earliest uh, sort of footprints or, or visual indications of change, at least in vegetative condition, due to infrastructure and dwelling establishment within Pajarina. Now compare this 2016 image to the 2020 image, we see a completely different um, distribution of colors and layout. We don't see that, that red color really at all, that bright red color. Instead, what we tend to see within Pajarina as well as to the south um, is more of these sort of teals and blues, and in some cases, little uh, slight purplish colors. This teal color, conversely, compared to 2016, where we saw uh, season one as having high NDVI and therefore bright red colors, here we see a teal suggesting that we have a lot of blue and a lot of green. Those come from season two and season three. So we have high NDVI in season two and season three relatively low NDVI in season one. That's why we see the teal color, the combination of the blue and green coming through and we lose the red. Um, this teal coloration also gives a sort of visual um, extent of cultivation um, uh, outside of the refugee settlement boundary where we see this. Um, it's not indicative of vegetative loss to the south of, um, of Pajrina, rather that teal uh, uh, describes instead uh, agricultural expansion. How do we structure this in the first place? Before we get into the code, um, we want to first figure out how we divvy up the year into these different periods. And so what we can do um, is first look at the time series, look at the NDVI time series, sort of get a sense of the phenological change throughout the year. And we can do that in this case, as we see over five years to get just sort of a general sense of what's happening. Um, we can also look at the crop calendar, which we see on the right-hand side of the image. Um, this is one of many different crop calendars, but we can see uh, different periods of planting shown in green and harvesting shown in orange. It's that harvesting period or really right before the harvest when uh, we expect to see the most, uh, the strongest vegetative signal. So uh, following these two, we can divide up this year into four um, different sort of start end dates, which together are going to make three periods for us. T1 to T2 would be May through July. That would be a good time to look at um, peanut uh, harvest, for example. Um, first harvest of the year. Um, August through September would be a reasonable time for corn and millet. And then October through December um, would be a millet, sorghum, and soybean. So we have T1 to T2 is going to make season one. T2 to T3 is season two, and T3 to T4 is season uh, three. Um, you'll note that we don't really have anything um, from January through July, uh, through uh, May rather. Uh, that's fine. We don't necessarily, with our approach here, we're not necessarily interested in capturing um, periods when there, when we don't see a lot of harvest uh, or, or pronounced uh, green up, but of course we, we could design it to, uh, to look at any time of the year. Um, at Zatri in Jordan, which was an example we saw a couple uh, uh, tasks ago, really different story here, right? Totally different part of, of the world. Um, we primarily have barley and wheat. Um, so we have these two uh, different periods, um, T2 to T3 for um, wheat, um, mainly in the month of June. And then we have a mid-September through mid-November period, which would be T3 to T4. 
And so both of those are targeted for these different crops and we can, we can look at them together. I should note that these time series that we're seeing, uh, the phenological curves that we're seeing here, as well as in our example uh, back here, uh, that's, this is based on MODIS uh, daily data and it's, there's a bit of smoothing happening here. Um, so we have daily data to help us inform this. And of course, that's happening at a, a somewhat large footprint. Um, but let's, let's hop into the code and see how we, how we do this. Um, here we are in our, our link. Um, as before, we're going to load up our different uh, settlement boundary uh, data sets, our assets at Pajarina and Zatri. I'm going to select Pajarina. Um, now I'm just going to enter the different time variables and these values refer to the day of the year uh, within um, our 0 to 365 calendar, or 1 to 365 calendar rather. Um, and so we have May 1st, 1st of August, 1st of October, and then 31st of December, sort of representative start end dates of our different um, uh, harvest periods. We have the same setup for Zatri, but of course different uh, dates because we have different kinds of crops and different climatic conditions. Um, we've looked at this sort of uh, code snippet before, so I won't go into this in detail, but we're uh, just filtering uh, Sentinel-2 uh, time series data set here filtering both by location and time as well as cloud cover. As before, we're going to add NDVI to that. Um, and then we take our uh, Sentinel-2 data set and we um, go back and filter this by um, our two different uh, start and end years, 2016 to 2020. Um, so we're getting this full picture um, and we can just map our NDVI um, to all of those images in the image collection that results to get sort of a representative uh, 2016 to 2020 image. We can also uh, uh, slice through and just take um, one year at a time, 2016 to 2017, uh, sorry, 2016 and then 2017, so on through 2020. These become our sort of annual images that we're going to dig into now in the next section and do um, this uh, internal sort of intra-annual filtering by day of year between uh, those start and end dates that we identified t1 to t2 t2 to 3 t3 and t3 to t4 each of these periods then p1 p2 p3 refer to different um, harvest periods now now we've got our image collection sorted into different times of year for in this case 2016 just an example year to get going um, to visualize this now we have a bunch of images over many, many months in some cases. How do we get a representative image? Well, in our case, we're just going to take um, the um, minimum and maximum values first to uh, get a visualization range over that entire period. Um, we're then going to take each of those periods, P1, P2, and P3, each of those individual bands, stack them together into a single image. And um, and I, I forgot to mention that we're when we uh, select our image over the uh, representative image, we're taking the maximum value. We could do the mean, we could do the median. Um, the maximum perhaps is is the most effective for visualization purposes because we're really accentuating um, the sort of extreme values here. We can really more readily pull out the differences. So when we plot this, we'll do the same thing for 2017, 2018. I'm just scrolling through. It's the same code done for these different years. Uh, we end up having each of these years represented here. Um, and just by comparing 2016 and 2020 in our map here, we can see exactly the same outputs that we had before. This allows a really nice um, uh, rapid and I think pretty um, intuitive way once we get around needing to understand, once we're familiar or comfortable with interpreting some of these colors that we see, um, which is not just, you know, NDVI, uh, it's a color interpretation that depends on understanding how the three different periods work together. Uh, once we're comfortable with doing that, we can really start um, teasing out some of the differences that we see um, within and surrounding the refugee settlement. And of course, having uh, the high-res imagery is also really helpful because we can start uh, cross-referencing some of the, the images that we see here um, with some of the base map images with some of the spectral values we see. Um, so it's a really nice way if we're, for example, interested in highlighting areas that are 
uh, if we're interested in collecting training data, we can use this to hide, to select uh, sites um, that might have high NVI value at one time of year or two two times of the year, but not another time period, right? So we can look at these different sort of periods and use that to inform our training data collection. We can also um, do this year after year after year. So we can assess how the different seasons play out uh, over different years, and we can gauge just how um, how varied um, the interannual cycle really can be um, in, uh, well, really any kind of environment, but in our case study here where we're looking at um, a, a newly established settlement that's sort of just um, coming onto the landscape in a previously vegetated area. So here's our 2016 image, comparing that to 2017, very, very different, right, in terms of the layout. We also see um, the beginnings, very clear uh, that there's uh, agricultural plot boundaries being established here, uh, as well as here, and indeed in the surrounding settlements. Um, 2018, another different story. So this overarching red here suggests that there could be uh, sort of a different climatic condition. It looks like there's much higher NDVI in season one, period one, compared to the previous year. Sort of lose that again when we go into 2019. And then um, into 2020, we see some suggestion of sort of stabilization where we're starting to see sort of a similar trend year after year. So this False color compositing approach uh, allows a really uh, uh, nice way to visualize differences in, could be NDVI, could be NBR, could be EVI, whatever you like, over time, um, both between years and between seasons. So it's a really nice, efficient way to do that. Um, and it gives us a good visual reference uh, for comparing how, for understanding how the vegetative condition is changing at uh, some of our different settlements. And I didn't walk through this, but uh, feel free to jump in that code and do the same thing for the Zatri example. Um, you'll just want to uncomment the um, the specific time one, time two, time three, time four periods for the Zatri uh, case study, and of course update the AOI in the same way, and you'll be able to explore how things are changing um, in a very different location like Zatri. Okay, so um, what about assessing uh, land degradation at refugee settlements? Um, we have looked at um, change in veg vegetative condition. Um, we've looked at um, the rapid expansion and sort of the consequences on um, background land cover condition. Um, let's adopt here a more formal framework, or at least adapt a more formal framework from the sustainable development goal monitoring approach. So this is the SDG framework. Um, there are a series of goals from SDGs. One of them, SDG 15, is, is uh, pertinent for us today. That is the sustainable development goal to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. So all the things that go into that goal there are a series of targets that can be met to achieve those goals. One of those is 15.3. That is uh, a goal, tar a target rather, to combat desertification of restore degraded land and soil, um, and including land affected by desertification, drought, and floods, and achieve a land degradation neutral world. How do we assess whether or not that target has been reached? Well, we have an indicator that's associated with that target, and that's 15.3.1 is one of these indicators. And that specifically would be the proportion of land that is degraded over the total land area. So that's sort of our motivation. That's sort of a, a framing for thinking about how we can understand degradation um, over a, in a given region over time. Using this framework that here we've adapted from the trends.earth uh, website, which is an excellent resource for using remote sensing for sustainable development goal monitoring. Um, we have three different components that go into this SDG indicator assessment, land productivity, land cover, and soil organic carbon. And the way we think about this is, of course, a decline in um, land productivity would be indicative of, of degradation, um, but land cover is a little bit trickier. We have lots of vegetated land covers. What they, uh, for example, we have lots of different uh, wide variety of conversions between land covers as well. Using this framework, we would uh, think about degradation or um, uh, decline productivity as being associated with 
the conversion from high biomass land covers like forest to a low biomass land cover like urban, but it could also be um, grassland um, or it could be wetland. Um, these would be indicative of land degradation. There's a, a extensive matrix of all of these different conversions at this uh, trends.earth uh, link here that we that we provide at the bottom of the slide. Um, all there's yes, so all these different combinations of before after. So this change in mon the change in conditions during a monitoring period compared to a change uh, sorry compared to a previous baseline period. We're looking at this difference over time as an indication of land degradation and doing that through these different channels of productivity, land cover, and soil organic carbon. Now, for our purposes, we're not going to be looking at soil organic carbon today because we don't have reliable, um, extensive uh, data in our study area of soil organic carbon between two different dates. But we'll be able to do this uh, with land productivity and land cover as sort of an estimate of this overall land degradation picture. So to measure change in productivity, we're going to be using the remote sensing product of net primary productivity. Um, NPP, as it's commonly known, is a measure of the accumulation of vegetation over time. So another way to think about this is the growth of a forest would accumulate vegetative biomass that should indicate, should be captured as an increase of NPP over time. Um, conversely, the clearing of a forest would be a loss of NPP because we lose the biomass. To measure NPP, we'll use the MODIS product um, that has a 500 meter resolution, um, which is quite coarse, but it, it gives us a long time period to measure our baseline versus our monitoring uh, conditions. We also will use N uh, MODIS to measure change in land cover uh, that also has a 500 meter resolution. And as I mentioned, we'll be setting up this comparison between productivity and land cover using these baseline and monitoring periods. Uh, that sort of end before uh, the refugee settlement establishment and begin uh, six months or so after. Um, and as I mentioned on the bottom of the slide, we won't be using soil organic carbon SOC, commonly used, but we just don't have the data uh, for our study area. So let's hop into our Earth Engine uh, code and see how this works. As before, we're going to be uh, loading in Pajrina, focused on Pajrina. Here's our MODIS NPP product that we've imported at the top of the script, NPP and then land cover. These are two of the standard Google Earth Engine um, archive products from MODIS. Um, pretty simple what we're doing with NPP. We're going to filter by uh, this 16 year period from 2000 through the end of 2015. And then we're going to take the mean of all those values. Those are That's an annual product, so it's the mean of those years. And then we're going to uh, go back to the monitoring period and similarly take a product uh, mean of those uh, data uh, just from a few more recent years um, following refugee settlement establishment. We'll call the mean uh, before as the baseline, we'll call the mean um, following as the monitoring period, and we will then pretty simply go through and take the difference. We'll take the monitoring period and we're going to subtract that from the baseline period. So a decline in um, NPP should give us, between the baseline to monitoring, should give us a negative value. And if we run the script here, uh, we've given this little uh, nice uh, color palette here where green suggests an improvement in condition in NPP, I should say productivity, and uh, purple is a decline. Um, and so we see this pretty clear pattern, right? In the core of the settlement, we see a decline of NPP, but within um, the periphery of the boundary, settlement boundary, and indeed around it, we see an increase. Um, popping back to our presentation here, um, we see sort of a somewhat mixed story then, right? It's not a total uniform story. We see improvement of NPP at the edge and loss in the core. Uh, we also see an improvement in the southern, uh, to the southern extent of the settlement boundary, right where we saw in the previous uh, task with the three uh, season compositing that we have cultivation there. Um, so that suggests that, that could be contributing to improved MPP uh, surrounding the refugee settlement. Um, so this is interesting, right? Quite a distinct um, a pattern here. Let's take a look at the land cover perspective. Okay, so hopping back into our script, um, 
I'm going to turn off, I'm going to comment out all of the NPP data, and I'm going to uh, start working with our land cover change data. This is a little bit different because we're working with categorical data. And so we want to take our different land cover classes uh, that MODIS land cover data uh, give us. Um, and we'll, we'll deal with the comparison with categorical data. But first, we're going to take the mode land cover across that same baseline period and then the mode land cover across that monitoring period. Now we have these two different um, data sets from the baseline and the monitoring period. And MODIS has 17 different land cover classes. We need to compress those into a smaller group so we can have kind of a cleaner comparison of, of change to assess degradation. So I'm going to use the Earth Engine remap function and take this list of 17 values and compress it into this list of eight. And so really what that means um, is that the uh, many, many forest and shrubland sort of subclasses will be lumped together into a single forest and shrubland class. Uh, we do that for the baseline and the monitoring period, and then we can uh, we can visualize those here, where uh, the yellow color suggests cropland and the green color suggests grassland. And we see already uh, a distinct break here. Cropland to uh, grassland, like we see as we go from the baseline to the monitoring, that would be suggestive of a de of a degradation of a decline. Um, in this area, so where we see this green blob, this used to be yellow, that means that we had um, uh, cropland at the cane grassland. Um, so that's suggestive of a decline, but let's go a little bit further and actually do this quantitative analysis. Um, we're gonna to do this, we can't just work with the categorical data of saying, sorry, a value of one in the baseline minus a value of one in the monitoring period, because um, any difference between uh, any like class will give us zero. So we lose that indication of what the class was. We lose the stability. And similarly, you can see how if we go from, for example, cropland to wetland, which would be a change of two, we could also go from wetland to forest, three to one. That's also a change of two. So we lose this indication of trajectory. The way we get around that is we scale one of our categorical data sets. We'll, we'll start with the baseline data. We'll scale that by a factor of 100. That uh, doesn't change the underlying data, but it means that when we do the subtraction down here, um, now we have these unique values uh, that, that uh, change. We go from 200 in the baseline period to one in the monitoring period. That's a value of 199. That's the only way we're going to get this value of 199. Similarly, grassland to forest gives us a value of 200 minus 4, uh, which is 196. That's the only way we'll get that value of 196. Um, and so we have all these different potential trajectories laid out here. Not all of these are going to be present at our site. We have a bunch of stable trajectories also, forest and shrubland being stable, wetland being stable. Uh, all of these play out. And then um, we have a big range of values again. Now we're really just interested in looking at the uh, improvement, stable, or, or decline in, in uh, degradation in let, from land cover perspective. And so we're going to similarly take that whole range of values that we've identified as being um, degradation, stable, or improvement, and compress those into three different classes. A zero class would be um, degradation, a one class would be stable, and two would be improvement. These are arbitrary numbers. They just have to be different. We could choose any uh, number. They could be negative. It doesn't matter. We just need to know which is which. These are just encoded. Um, and so now when we visualize this, this difference between them, uh, which is right here, we see this uh, with our nice little color palette that is similar to the one we used for NPP. We see this uh, decline indeed in purple uh, where we had cropland being converted to grassland according to MODIS. White is stable, and green is um, is uh, grassland being converted to cropland. So we have this conversion in this area, quite different actually conversions inside and out. Now, if I pop back to the slide uh, to the presentation, um, here's sort of the story we see. We see the baseline as uh, being broadly cropland. We see the monitoring period as starting this incursion of grassland within the settlement. 
We know that's not really grassland though, right? We know that that is mixed pixels from all the other images we've seen of Pajarina, mixed pixels of built up uh, structures with infrastructure and gardens and vegetation, really complicated pixels. MODIS sees that in a 500 meter pixel as being grassland. That's what it classifies. Similarly, the cropland, we're aggregating tons of, of different features into these large 500 meter pixels and MODIS sees that as cropland. So there are some, we have some questions about the accuracy of the classification to begin with, but for the purpose of our task here, um, we're just working through how we even conceptualize this. And as uh, before, we see a declining, uh, this conversion, crop, cropland to grassland, is according to the big framework um, from land cover conversions would be indicative of decline because cropland should have a higher biomass compared to grassland. Um, and then we see in the corner, southeast corner, some improvement. Uh, according to our modus detection, um, and then the rest of the image is, is stable here. So we see quite comparable stories between MPP and land cover change. We see declining MPP within Pajarina, and then we see degrading land cover conditions in Pajarina, and a pretty similar uh, spatial pattern as well, right? They, there's quite good agreement between the MPP and land cover um, in terms of where we see improvement or decline. Now, it's not always that uh, similar. It's not always going to be that clean and there might be some um, disagreements in certain areas um, between our NPP and our land cover classification. So we really need to understand in either scenario the local context. We need to understand what's causing this. We need to make sure that the data we're using uh, are valid in terms of spatial resolution, in terms of timing, that they're actually capturing uh, the information we're most interested in. Um, I think this is a reasonable approximation of the story within and surrounding Pajarina, um, even though we have some questions about the actual land cover classification accuracy. Improving the spatial resolution um, with uh, Sentinel-2 or Landsat or high, very high resolution products would really go a long way uh, to, uh, to improving our overall confidence in this kind of assessment. Um, and maybe we need to make our own custom land cover maps as well, something that's really tailored uh, that may be necessary. Um, so we've got a lot of citations here. Please check these out. There's a, a great uh, selection here from, from different uh, fields and different scholars uh, working in different parts of the world. Um, all of these are looking at uh, stories of vegetative change and degradation in refugee settings. As before, please enter any questions in the Q&A box. We'll gladly answer them. Uh, we've had great questions so far. I'm looking forward to, to hearing your questions. Um, and then we will uh, work through the Q&A um, live and then post the, the question and answer following the webinar. Uh, we have our contact information here. Please don't hesitate to reach out any questions or comments. Uh, and I uh, just wanna really thank you for working through part three of the humanitarian applications training with us. And I hope you'll join us for part four of the training, which will be sort of a turn towards looking more at uh, still using Earth Engine, still using uh, NASA data, of course, but uh, more thinking about uh, climate hazards at refugee camps. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, everybody that stuck around for the question and answer session. Uh, we are currently transitioning a uh, screen so that we can share that and we can all be viewing the same document. There we go. Thank you so much, Solon. Big thanks to both Hannah and Jamin for this amazing presentation. Uh, why don't we jump right into it? Looks like we got uh, a couple questions and hopefully some more will come in over the next, uh, say, 25 minutes. That's how much time that we have left in our Q&A session. So question number one, for the data set, how can we use the uh, NICFI Planet data set with three and a half meter resolution? Yeah, um, yeah, so this is a new, uh, I guess, I can't remember when they actually hosted it, started hosting it on Earth Engine, but, um, you can use these uh, mosaics that Planet has put together um, that you can interact with and visualize and do different kind of analyses with on Earth Engine called the um, NICFI. Um, but there are a couple of limitations with it in that, um, I mean, yes, it's three and a half meter resolution, but it's just available going back to 2015 um and just has coverage within the tropics so we don't have the same kind of spatial and temporal archive that we can use with something like landsat 8 or landsat 7 or sentinel 2 and so there's that kind of caveat with it um and yeah and as we have right now here 
you would also kind of have to do your own land cover classification map um, to really be able to compare the, the NISP kind of derived either functional settlement boundary or, you know, just settlement built up area to, um, you know, some sort of other kind of verified uh, classification. And so, um, but yeah, we could absolutely use the, the NISP data set um, to, to explore. Um, vegetation settlement dynamics. Great, thanks, Anna. Question number two, what is the crop diversity of refugee camps in Colombia and Venezuela? Yeah, I uh, I wrote this response. I'm personally not familiar with the diversity of crop types um, or really kind of the variation in extent of crop areas uh, in terms of the sizes and distribution and Kind of where they are geographically um, in refugee camps in Colombia or Venezuela, um, as well as like the refugee policy around agricultural land holdings within refugee settlements in those two countries. So um, take everything <laughs> that I'm saying with a grain of salt in that sense. Um, but there may be some country or sub-country or regional level classifications specifically on crop types that are available. And those would probably be the more accurate uh, crop classification maps than say using the ESA or um, the ESRI cover products that we explored in this training. So my first kind of suggestion would be to see if there's any kind of country level classifications that are available um, that you can access. And then secondly, to see if there's uh, reports or maps or any kind of information that has been published by the UNHCR, um, the UN Refugee Agency, the Food and Agricultural Organization, which is FAO, or the World Food Program, WFP. Um, they often host uh, a lot of their data and reports um, and kind of like informational material that they put together um, on this website that we have listed here which is data.unhcr.org. Um, and there's a tab there where you can go to individual countries to see kind of on a country by country uh, basis what information they have hosted. Um, and sometimes they do have like settlement level classification maps um, that are stored in like PDF uh, style formats. And sometimes they have even have shape files to things and, and TIFFs. So um, that would be another resource to check out um, to see if there's any kind of information available there on, on crop classifications. Wonderful. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, question number three. Sometimes it is an option to work with mosaic data, especially for areas with high cloud cover. How do we account for the detected changes that might be attributed to the different conditions of the pixels in the mosaic data? Uh, for example, the baseline or the study period? Yeah, um, so yeah, we can definitely work with Mosaic data um, to essentially kind of mask out clouds. So if we want to take imagery from over a year or a couple of months um, and want to account for clouds, usually creating some sort of median or average or greenest pixel mosaic uh, or composite, um, allows us to address that high cloud cover that we may see. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, you know, with creating a mosaic or some kind of temporal composite in that sense, you are potentially losing out on detecting those changes that, that could be happening across that span of imagery that you're collecting um, or that you're inputting into the mosaic. And so, um, yeah, that's something you maybe just have to kind of create shorter time stamp mosaics to see if there are changes happening that you're not actually um, like throwing out any of those changes or having that kind of be washed out in the creation of the mosaic itself. Um, but yeah, it really depends on kind of like the season that you would be creating the mosaic for or the, the context of um, what kind of land cover, seasonal land cover changes may be happening um, to kind of best guide when you should be making that mosaic for. Um, yeah. 
Great, thanks, Hannah. Uh, and definitely a big challenge for tropical areas which have lots of cloud cover. Just you know, if you are limited to optical data, uh, that's certainly a huge challenge. Uh, there's you know, with the recent launch of Landsat 9, and for those that are familiar with the uh, the harmonized Landsat Landsat and Sentinel product HLS. Uh, that might be able to get the temporal cadence down, so you have greater opportunities for uh, breaks in the cloud cover. But it is certainly a huge issue and one that will not be going away for uh, for the foreseeable future. So, uh, great question number four: Will repos and code be available uh, in terms of NPP time series analysis? Are using the GPG 1.0 methodology to monitor SDG 15.3.1? Um, for the first question, yes. Um, all the, I, I mean, yeah, I believe all the PowerPoints are shared as PDFs and the code links that jump you out into the code uh, or the Google Earth Engine code editor with the, the scripts already there um, and the data layers that we're bringing in to visualize and access and work with, all of that is shared publicly. So. Yes, the, the repos and code are available um, as links in the PowerPoint PDFs that are, um, are shared. Um, in terms of the second question for the GPD, GPG 1.0 methodology, I'm not sure. Um, this would be a great question for Jamin, who I know is, um, I think, trying to get to the computer. Um, but I Think that so from my understanding there's a variety of different types of methodologies that can be used to monitor land degradation and some of those maybe depend on the types of input data that you have available so in our case we didn't have the soil organic carbon or didn't feel like we had a you know validated enough soil organic carbon layer to work with so that's why we kind of had that customized approach for looking at land degradation um but yeah there's i think a handful of different kind of ways to get at understanding or mapping land degradation and um, I'm not familiar with this GPG 1.0 methodology but um, yeah I'm you know that may be another way to kind of get at monitoring uh, SDG 15.3.1. Great uh, thank you for those that are submitting more questions uh, we do have a couple more coming in so question number five why did you decide to use k-means to determine boundaries and not a supervised classification algorithm? Yeah, this is a really great question. Um, so one of the obvious benefits of working with an unsupervised classification is that you don't have to create your own training data, which can be really time consuming um, and just, yeah, can take a lot of time and. And energy to put that data together in terms of you know either collecting points or polygons at visually identifiable settlement and non-settlement or whatever kind of classes that you're interested in in delineating for so um you know kind of our our simple response to that is to just sample points um using the sample um function method in in Google Earth Engine and so um, yeah with that um, we kind of have this like really kind of easy easy to use training data set um, to input to the k-means cluster classification um, and so yeah there is you know we could use more rigorous um, supervised machine learning like a random forest um, or SVM a support vector machine type of classification to identify built up area um but yeah k-means is kind of like the a low-hanging fruit uh tool to use in terms of just delineating classes really easily and um luckily within the context of where we were applying it with pajarina there is a really kind of stark contrast between the ndvi values for settlement and ndvi values for non-settlement pixels and so just having those two classes with the randomly sampled points that we sample from from the NDVI composite allows us to really quickly um, with really minimal effort on the part of the user to delineate the settlement boundary um, in a much more kind of true to form fashion than what we have with the official planning boundary. 
Um, so yeah, there's, you know, you could definitely explore other options with doing a supervised classification to get at that settlement boundary, uh, functional settlement boundary layer as well. Great, thanks, Hannah. And it's, yeah, like you said, it's so important that, you know, that you were able to show examples and provide scripts for people, uh, you know, in, that aren't going to need to gather a lot of training data and validation data, et cetera, to be able to run these types of analyses, uh, just to be able to, uh, you know, to have that, you know, um, opportunity for folks, I think is, is really important. So, you know, thank you for, for explaining that. Uh, question number six, hi, this is a question related to the previous webinar. I wanted to ask whether you could point to any resource to use be fast with R. Yeah, um, there's a lot of, um, well, not a lot. There's a handful of different kind of tutorials available um, to use be fast and R. There's, it's there's really two packages, both be fast monitor and then be fast spatial, which are the two R libraries. And I'm trying to find a couple of links to post into the the chat here about. Um, learning about them one second um but yeah there's um one in particular that i'm thinking of that kind of walks through a full uh example of using be fast and r kind of like start to finish in terms of like having an input image stack um and then trying to like set up the be fast monitor and then um defining your parameters and visualizing the outputs and kind of interpreting them for different time periods um so let me keep looking for that and then i will post it in the chat here wonderful and uh all of these q a documents are being posted to the training webpage. for example the uh the first weeks parts one and two will be posted today uh, and so for all of you who are asking these questions, and especially for these links that Hannah was just referring to, we do hope that you will check the training page by next Tuesday, where we will have populated those links and we'll have them on there for you to access. So I guess we'll give it one more minute. If anybody has any last minute questions, please do post them uh, before we wrap up today's training. I just posted in the other link that I was trying to find. <laughs> Awesome, thanks, Anna. All right, it looks like we have another question. Uh, it's asking, is the QGIS uh, trends.earth easier to use? Uh, I'm not familiar with QGIS trend.earth. Um, I imagine that's some sort of plugin to maybe interact with time series data. Um, okay. Previous webinar covering trends not earth. Yeah, maybe there's um if there's a previous thing for that. Great. But sounds interesting. I might have to check it out myself. All right. Question number eight. Is Modus the right tool for land cover classification in savannah landscapes? Can we make an error propagation? to assess the validity of land cover change results? I would say it really depends. I don't know if MODIS is the right tool for land cover classification in Savannah landscapes. I think it really depends kind of what, what class scheme you want to implement in your classification. So MODIS being 250, uh, meter spatial resolution. Um, if you're trying to find, you know, identify like something like built up area, MODIS may not be the right tool for doing that. And so, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I think there's a lot of different imagery sources you could probably use for doing land cover classification in Savannah landscapes, just depending on what you're interested in. Um, did I hear that Jamin, Jamin had joined? Yeah, I'm back. Sorry for being away for a few minutes there.
Well, great. I think we have successfully gotten through all of the questions. So uh, thank you so much, Hannah and, and, and Jamin, for uh, one, the presentation, as well as answering all these great questions that we got from all the participants. Um, thank you to everybody that stuck around until the end. Uh, we hope that you really got a lot out of this part three, and we do hope that you will join us on Thursday for the last part in this webinar series. As we conclude today, I wanted to give an opportunity for Jamin and Hannah to provide any closing comments or thoughts that they might have to the participants. Jamin? Thanks, Sean. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining today and sticking around. Thanks so much to uh, Sean and Selwyn and the rest of the RSET team who have been really uh, obviously very instrumental in helping us uh, share this training with you all. Um, I just wanted to remind you that we have two prior parts to this training in case you haven't checked those out yet. Um, both uh, were presented last week, the first on urban damage monitoring with SAR, the second with uh, working uh, also with HANA on refugee settlement focused uh, change detection and uh, environmental assessments using satellite data, mainly for a sort of a more of a built up and infrastructural perspective rather than the vegetative perspective we focused on today. Um, we have one more part to this training which is on thursday of this week and there we're looking at uh, developing a climate index or uh, rather an index for climate hazard climate exposure in refugee camps um, so using a bunch of different remote sensing data we integrate them all into an index that's on thursday uh, please tune in um, and of course any questions or follow-ups or, or comments um, please send hannah or me or both of us an email and um, Hope to see you on Thursday. Thanks. Hannah, did you have any last thoughts or comments to any of the participants? Um, yeah, no, thank you all for joining. Um, it was really fun putting these presentations together, so I hope you enjoyed them as well. Uh, yeah, thanks to Jamin for co-organizing and the whole RSET uh, team for really helping us facilitate these this series of trainings. So thank you to all of them. I must say you two both did, you knocked it out of the part with this, uh, with your presentation. And also thank you so much for providing all the participants with the, the code through Earth Engine. I know that's gonna be of, of great value to not only the people joining today, but then in perpetuity, because all of these will be uh, freely available to the public. So hopefully a lot of people will be able to access them and, and be able to do some good analysis with them. Uh, as we wrap up again, thank you again, Hannah and Jamin. Also wanna thank the entire RSET team, Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, Sarah Cutshaw, uh, Jonathan O'Brien and Amita Mekta. Uh, thank you all for putting this together and we look forward to seeing you in two days for the conclusion of this webinar series. So be safe and we look forward to seeing you on Thursday.